Welcome back, everyone. We have a lot to jump into in this episode. First of all, we have the dividend yield of the S&P 500. The forward yield is 1.35%. That's low. That is very low. In fact, the last time that we've had this low of a dividend yield for SPY is back in the dot-com bubble area. And I know that we don't like these comparisons. Whenever we're making valuation comparisons, and the last time we have these type of valuations is back to the dot-com bubble, that's not a good thing. So with this low of a dividend yield for the S&P 500, I'm going to show you where I'm venturing to find higher yields, what companies I'm looking at, what industries I'm looking at, and how I'm getting a much better yield for my portfolio than the overall market. Now, we also have some crypto news. The SEC is warning to Coinbase is part of a worrisome trend for crypto. Right now, the SEC is going after one of the main ways that companies like Coinbase make money, which is lending securities. The CEO of Coinbase, Brian Armstrong, went onto Twitter to voice his complaints, and he says that there's some sketchy behavior coming out of the SEC. It's story time. So we're going to go over this whole issue. I'll be looking at both sides of it. And then we also have big news that the Elizabeth Holmes trial has begun. I'll give you my overall take of this trial. I'll give you what I think the outcome is likely to be. And we'll share what news so far has been revealed. What are the arguments of each side? What is Elizabeth Holmes saying as her defense? And what are the prosecutors saying? So we have a lot to jump into in this episode. If you like this type of content, make sure to thumbs up the video, as well as you can consider subscribing if you want to follow along week by week and see the outcome of my portfolio here. This is the majority of my net worth. I have most of my money in this one portfolio and I show publicly every single week how it does. If I gain money or if I lose money, if we have some big sell-off and I go back into the red, that's something that could happen and I would show it if it happened. So I'll be showing this every single week. If you're interested in following along, just make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Now, I consider myself a value investor. The strategy that I followed is buying companies that I think are undervalued based off their future growth potential and the amount of cash flow that they'll supply over the coming years. And I try to buy companies with some level of a margin of safety, meaning they have low downside, ample upside, and they have a long investment horizon. They're companies that are going to be around for 10 plus years. That is my target category of company. Low downside, ample upside, very long investment horizon. I also have a preference, of course, for dividend paying companies. In the past one month, I have earn dividends of $433. This is one way to view it. I also have a website that tracks my dividend growth over time. Here's a graph showing month by month my dividend growth. You can see that this goes up over time and I try to target companies that have a higher than average dividend yield. Now that's becoming more and more difficult over time as the dividend yield, the forward yield of the S&P 500 continues to plummet as the S&P 500 continues to surge. Take a look at this graph here. The red line on this graph is the dividend yield of the S&P 500. It's difficult to see, but right now, the nominal dividend yield is 1.35%. That's what it's at right now. If you're buying the S&P 500, you're buying a 1.35% dividend yield. Now we see the blue line below, which is the dividend yield in relation to the CPI inflation rate. So right now, the real yield between inflation and the dividend yield is negative 3.45%. Because right now they're seeing that inflation is about 4.85%, with the dividend yield being 1.35%, that means that your real yield after inflation is negative 3.45%. Now, of course, we don't think inflation will stay close to 5%, and I don't think it will either for too long. I think it will start to work its way back to 2%, but in the meantime, this is a very low yield. The dividend yield is at a nearly 20-year low. If we look at the last time that it was this low, we see it's right at that sweet spot right before the year 2000 with the dot-com bubble bursting. Now, you might be saying, Joseph, the reason that dividend yields are so low right now is because a lot of companies cut their dividends during 2020. There were a handful of companies that either froze their dividend or cut it, but most of them have returned their dividends. Look at the most recent quarter of dividend payments paid from SPY it's very close to the absolute peak. Over the last four quarters, $493 billion of dividends have been paid. That's very close to the peak, which was just a bit over $500 billion. So this isn't an issue of companies not paying out good dividends. This is an issue with the price of stocks outpacing the growth of dividends. The S&P 500 in five short years has over doubled well over doubled if you consider dividends reinvested. This graph here does not factor in dividends and the S&P 500 is up over 111%. And in fact, just the past trailing year, it's up 32%. It's like a 45 degree line, just continually climbing upwards. 
It's pretty incredible to see the growth of these prices. It doesn't matter how much companies try to raise their dividends, they cannot keep up with this price growth. It's clearly outpacing the growth of dividends. We can also break it down by different sectors. Can we find good value in real estate maybe? Maybe the REIT category hasn't, it hasn't recovered quite as much as the rest of the market? No, it actually has. REITs are at an all-time high. Even though many of them are struggling and their businesses aren't fully back to where they were before COVID, they're priced to perfection right now. Across the board, they're trading at higher valuations than they were before 2020. We can look at the healthcare industry. This is one of the ones that recovered the absolute quickest. The coronavirus sell-off was small and short-lived. It recovered very quick, and now the prices are zooming upwards. We can look at the financial sector. This one gave you a little bit more time to do research. This sell-off was more scary as people remained fearful of banks for a long time. But regardless, right now, even the financial sector is well above the 2020 levels. It's up over 20% from then, not counting dividends. The technology sectors is one of the ones that has the most enthusiasm. Like the healthcare sector, it recovered very quickly and then it just zoomed upwards. It's now up 55% plus since the beginning of 2020. Are all of these companies really worth 55% more? I don't know, but that's what they're being priced at. We can take a look at the consumer discretionary category. These are some companies that I really like. I really like this category. Companies like Walmart, Home Depot, Costco, those type of consumer discretionary brands I think are incredibly powerful. Well, we see the same thing with this category. In fact, the returns of the consumer discretionary category is outpacing tech. It's up over 58% since 2020. Are these companies really worth 58% more? They're being valued that way. And looping back to my portfolio, again, I consider myself to be a value investor. What I'm looking to do is to buy good companies for less than they're worth. That is ultimately what I'm wanting to do. Buy companies for less than they're worth. And when prices are surging like this and there's enthusiasm, that becomes increasingly difficult. One of my favorite quotes is from Warren Buffett. It's one that I'm sure you've heard. It's one of the most common repeated investing quotes ever. Be fearful when others are greedy. Be greedy when others are fearful. This is such good investing advice. So plain, so straightforward, so applicable. And if people followed this advice, they'd make a lot more money. But the problem is, is even though this quote is easy to read and to think that you're going to do it, it's a lot more difficult done than said. It's difficult to stop yourself from buying overpriced assets when everything looks rosy, when the future looks perfect. You want to pay more and more and more because you're seeing all the gains that you've recently had. And likewise, during 2020, during the huge sell-off and coronavirus was spreading, it looked like the world was on fire, the future was very bleak. That was very difficult to convince yourself to buy companies. Seeing them go down 5% every single day, week after week, makes it so that you're fearful. When people, generally speaking, are fearful, there's valid reasons why. And when people, generally speaking, are greedy, there's valid reasons why. So this advice is easy to read, but difficult to follow. If I'm looking at the scale of things right now, of whether we should be greedy or fearful, I think we're definitely on the side that we should be more fearful. I think we should be a little bit more cautious and careful with our purchases because the S&P 500 continues to climb like crazy, outpacing the fundamentals of these businesses. Now, having said that, we also have the advice that we shouldn't try to time the market and we should continually buy into great assets. So we have a catch-22 here. We want to be fearful because other people are being greedy, but we also don't want to try to time the market and we don't want money sitting on the sidelines for too long. And what do we do in this situation? Well, I'll let you know what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm venturing out to different areas that I think offer unique value in today's market. For instance, if we look at the real estate category, we can look again at that graph showing the overall REIT market. Overall, it's well above where it was before 2020. Assets have gone up in value, not counting dividends, by over 10%. But if we dive into some specific holdings, I still think there's value here. While the S&P 500 has a 1.35% yield, Vici currently yields 4.8%. After their merger with MGP, they'll have an above 4.8% yield. That is dramatically higher than the rest of the market. That gives you a positive return, even inflation adjusted. That outpaces the current high levels of inflation. Also, the price to funds from operation, which is kind of like the PE ratio for a REIT, is 15.7. That is very low compared to most other REITs. That is not priced in with a lot of enthusiasm. Most REITs have a price to funds from operation of 20 or above. So as of right now, because Vici is a specialty REIT, it's not being priced with the same optimism as more broadly focused REITs are. We can also look at store capital. This is another specialty REIT focused on middle 
market companies. And while the real estate index is 10% above where it was before 2020, store capital is still 10% below where it was. It hasn't fully recovered. Store capital has a 4% dividend yield, much higher than the rest of the market. It's trading at a price to funds from operation of 19. And I still think this company has a lot of growth ahead of it. It's being priced as though it's not going to fully recover. And I do think that this company will make a full recovery out of this pandemic. Simon Properties, another REIT that I've been buying recently because this company is being priced with a lot of pessimism, not optimism. That's exactly what I like to see. Wall Street thinks that malls are dead. They believe that this category is eventually going to die out and everything will move to online sales. Well, I think that Wall Street needs to get outside sometime and visit some malls because they are packed. If you go to malls, most of them are packed right now. And I do not believe these are eventually going to die out. And like Store Capital, Simon Property has not even recovered back to its original price before 2020. And that's including with the news of their completed acquisition of Taubman. Taubman malls sit in the middle of busy city centers and plazas. This is the type of real estate that you want to own. And now Simon Property owns 80% of it. So while the rest of the market's being priced with a lot of enthusiasm, these specialty REITs are not. And that's exactly what I like to find is high quality companies that aren't being priced with a lot of enthusiasm because the coast is still unclear. I think that eventually we will get over the coronavirus. It's taking longer than most people would expect, but eventually we'll get over it and these companies will come back in full force. And when they do, when the coast becomes clear, that's when they'll get their credit from Wall Street. Peter Lynch says, remember, Things are never clear until it's too late. By the time the coast becomes clear with these companies and the coronavirus is a thing of the past, these companies will already reflect that in their price. So that's what I've been doing so far. If I can't find individual companies that I think are of great value, I don't just blindly buy different companies. I'll just put it in an ETF. I'll throw the money in SCHD or JEPI and just leave it there. And unless I can find better value, I'll just invest in ETFs. One of the reasons I like tracking my dividend growth month after month and year after year is because it helps remind me to not focus on trying to time the market. Rather than trying to time every single one of my buys, I try to buy companies that still offer a good yield and good value. And as long as I'm doing that every single month, these numbers are going to go up over time, regardless of what the market does overall. But I think that overall, things are becoming expensive. It is getting more difficult to find value. Recently, Morgan Stanley said that stocks may fall 15% by the year end. And at this point, I would welcome it. If stocks fell 15%, Think about what other companies might become more interesting. You can buy into them at better prices. So many people read these type of headlines and they read it as though they should be fearful or afraid of a stock market sell-off. Unless you're planning on cashing out of your portfolio in the next couple years, you shouldn't be afraid of a 15% decline. That would open up a lot of really interesting opportunities that I think are desperately needed. If Morgan Stanley's right and stocks fall off 15%, that's something that I personally would be excited about. Now moving on, let's go ahead and jump into this news of the SEC finally getting into the cryptosphere in a very big way. In particular, the SEC and other regulators seem concerned about crypto companies offering high interest rates for people to lend out their assets, a service traditionally performed by the banks. The Weeble CEO said, quote, The SEC has been flirting with crypto regulations for some time, but today's news of Coinbase receiving a Wells notice from the SEC feels very much like the first salvo of a long and drawn out conflict that may engulf the whole space. So he's making a prediction that this move from the SEC is just the beginning of a very long and drawn out conflict. Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, went on Twitter and said some really sketchy behavior coming out of the SEC recently. Story time. Just a recommendation. If I'm going up against regulators, I probably wouldn't start off with claiming that they're being sketchy. It's just not the right, I, I think the right thing is to start off accusing them right from the start. That's kind of what Peloton did. They started to blame the regulators and then they quickly turned that around and said it was our fault. We were the ones making the mistakes. The regulators were correct. So in my opinion, it's not the best strategy to take to accuse them of being sketchy before you're even done working with them. But regardless, this is his opinion. He says millions of crypto holders have been earning yield on their assets over the last few years. It makes sense. If you want to lend out your funds, you can earn a return. Everyone seems happy. A bunch of great companies in crypto have been offering versions of this for years. Coinbase came out and recently said we'd be launching our own version. We were planning on going live in a few weeks, so we reached out to the SEC to give them a friendly heads up and briefing. They responded by telling us this lend feature is a security. The SEC is saying that lending in this capacity constitutes a security. 
He says, seems strange. How can lending be a security? So we asked the SEC to help us understand and share their view. They refused to tell us why they think it's a security and instead subpoenaed a bunch of records from us. We complied. Demand testimonies from our employees. We complied. And then they tell us they will be suing us if we proceed with the launch with zero explanation as to why. He goes on saying, ostensibly, the SEC's goal is to protect investors and create fair markets. So who are they protecting here and where's the harm? People seem pretty happy to be earning yield on these various products across lots of other crypto companies. I think this is a very short-sighted view of what the SEC does. People are very happy with their financial products and their returns before the 2009 collapse. They were very unhappy after systemic risk was exposed. The SEC doesn't want to be trailing again. They see this new fast-growing financial market and they want to implement regulations before there's any type of systemic risk. Now, I think a lot of what Brian says is accurate. Coinbase is probably having some unfair targeting. They're having a higher level scrutiny on them than other competitors. But I think this is something to be expected. They're the biggest player. They're in a new fast growing financially unregulated industry. And there's a lot of money going into crypto. Anytime there's this much money sloshing around into a new industry, the SEC is going to come in and regulate it. They don't want to have systemic risk like they did with the banking system. The whole category of crypto and DeFi has so much money pouring into it right now. It's becoming mainstream. Here's an advertisement for a new crypto exchange. You might see some familiar faces here. Can I talk to you about something? Yeah, we talked about it. I got another 10 years left, maybe 15. Not bad, this is big. What do you think, are you in? You know what, I'm in. Let's call everyone. Hang on a minute. Oh, how dare you call this number? Okay, I'm in. Whatever. Who was that? That was my mom. Huh. Hey, Donut, don't eat that. Yo, what's up? Yeah, yeah, I'm in. Yeah, sounds good, I'm in. I'm in. Hey, Arthur, I quit. I'm in. T-Bone, is it the downstairs toilet again? Hello, Tom. Doggy coin? Sue, Mark. Are you in? I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. All right, this last one might be tough. Nah, he loves you. Probably just getting on the dentist. This guy. First, even if you wanted to come back, we wouldn't take you. Yes, you would. Yeah, yeah we, we would. would. You're right, we would. What's up? I'm getting into crypto. With FTX. You in? We're providing gives 360 degree access to the crypto markets with the ability to trade everything from alts to DeFi. I believe I'm in, but still hate you. Understood. Take care. Best of the family. Is he in? Yep. Did he say he hates you? He did. Even on the phone, that guy sounds handsome. You know crypto is mainstream when you have $20 million ad campaigns featuring Tom Brady. We also have Steph Curry under the same campaign promoting the same product. A couple days ago, he tweeted out, just getting started in the crypto game, y'all got any advice? So when anything becomes this mainstream this quickly, when it has this much money involved, I can see the regulations following very quickly as well. Now, of course, we also have the big news that the Elizabeth Holmes trial is finally starting. It's time to finally get out the popcorn. We finally have the trial ahead of us. It's actually started and it started yesterday. So we'll go over some of the updates of this trial. But just to give some, some thoughts before going into the actual details, I did a poll a week ago that said, will Elizabeth Holmes be found guilty and serve jail time? With 9.3 thousand votes, 77% of you said yes, 23% of you said no. Most people, I think more than even believing she'll be found guilty and serve jail time, I think most of you are wanting that to happen. Because if you read about the details of this case, if you followed up pretty closely, she clearly lied to investors. She said that her devices could do things that they couldn't. She misrepresented the technology multiple times and she took a lot of money from investors. And once the company imploded, all those investors lost their money and even customers were hurt. Some customers got false readings on their blood tests. But what we're gonna see now is the arguments, the real arguments from each side. For instance, the defense says that Theranos investors were savvy. They knew the risks. That's what Holmes lawyers said. This is such a frustrating thing to read. Of course, they know the risks of their investment. They know the risks of companies failing, but they were lied to. That's not a risk that you should have to take, that the person you're investing with is straight up lying to you. Now, another thing that they argued is that only a small number of tests were inaccurate. And this one was a bit shocking to me. After the government spent years investigating Theranos, he said he believes they found around 20 inaccurate tests. A number he told jurors was 0.000, 
0.25% of those conducted. I think that this is a very incorrect way of sharing this data. They gathered 20 inaccurate tests, so they're assuming that's the total amount of inaccurate tests. I don't think that's correct. I think that's a sample size. They found 20. There was likely many more. So that's what we know so far. This trial is just getting started. That was the first day, and we have some of the arguments of the defense, but this thing's going to go on likely for three months. So this is going to be an ongoing trial. And I'm glad that Elizabeth Holmes is finally facing a trial. It's been a long time. It's been delayed because of the pandemic. It's been delayed because she was pregnant. Now she's finally facing a trial, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. In my opinion, I agree with the majority of you. I'm firmly in the camp that I think that she should be found guilty of at least something, enough that she will serve some jail time. Because what she did on multiple occasions is clearly dishonest. She misrepresented her technology to investors, and I think she did so intentionally on multiple occasions. Everything that I've read from the Wall Street Journal and different books on the subject illustrate that very clearly. If she doesn't serve any jail time, it'll show startup companies and companies with big ambitions that they can say anything they want to investors with almost no recourse. If they flat out lie and waste investors' money and the company ends up imploding, that's okay. They'll just face a simple fine. They won't serve any jail time. So I think if Elizabeth Holmes is not found guilty, if she doesn't serve any jail time, I think that's set a very bad precedent. Now that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want bonus content, exclusive episodes, AMAs, you can check out the Patreon. There's a link in the description. When you join the Patreon, you also gain access to Qualtrum.com, which is the dividend grow tracking website that's included with it. So there's a link in the description if you want to check that out. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next episode.